Okay, ready? Okay, welcome. This is Roger Royce on Tell Radio with Silicon Valley Impact. We've been gone for a while, but now we're back. We're kicking off a new series here and a new season. And today we have with us Erin Philbrick, PhD. She's the Executive Director at the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University here in Silicon Valley. So Karen, welcome. Hello and good to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. So, so Karen, just by way of background, before we jumped into the uh, meteor substance of what you do, could you tell us a little bit about who you are and, and what your background is and how you came to San Jose and Silicon Valley? You bet. And I think my background perfectly demonstrates that you have to say yes to opportunity because you never know how your career trajectory will change based on experience. So I have a double master's PhD in various disciplines of psychology, and I was introduced to the transportation field the first day of my doctoral program with an opportunity to travel and to earn extra money as a research assistant. I found myself in a yard office collecting data on locomotive engineers and conductors, and that data looked at sleep-wake patterns in a 24-7 environment, as well as post-traumatic stress symptoms following grade crossing accidents and trespasser incidents. I fell in love, changed the focus of my program from counseling psychology to be more active research, and I've spent my whole career in this industry now. Uh, Rod Deardon, who you may be familiar with, the largest train station west of the Mississippi is named in his honor. He recruited me out of Denver, Colorado in 2009 to take on the director of research position. Then successfully, I went to deputy executive director and then finally executive director upon his retirement. That effectively moved me out of the front lines of research and more into administration and leadership. Okay, and how long have you been at San Jose State? I've been here 14 years at San Jose oh. State University. Oh, wow. Time and flies. <laughs> and the the Transportation Institute program that you've created, how long has that been around? It was founded in 1991 by Secretary Norman Y. Mineta. You may know him because he was a major figure in the Silicon Valley. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, just a, just a giant uh, in, absolutely. This, in California. But uh, 91, that's 30 years. It's 31 years, 32 yes. years. He realized, so obviously he was our mayor, the first Asian American mayor of a major metropolitan city in the United States. He represented us in Congress for 20 years. He was then tapped to be Secretary of Commerce in the Clinton administration and Secretary of Transportation in the Bush administration. But back when he was in Congress, he realized that there was a disconnect between research and policy change in transportation. And he realized some funding needed to be dedicated to investigating the best steps forward. And so he founded the University Transportation Center Program, which has gone on to be overseen by the US Department of Transportation. It's competitive in nature. In fact, the most recent competition, there were 230 proposals submitted for about 20 spots. So we're pleased that we won, but it was a dogfight. You got to make sure that you've got the, the political support, but more importantly, the objective data to support your expertise and what you can get done. Okay. And in your role there, is it it's your executive director? Do you oversee the research then that gets done? Yes, I oversee. We do surface transportation research, education, technology transfer, and workforce development. In terms of research, we have over 200 contracts in place with faculty and students from really across the nation who are engaged in researching topics related to improving the mobility of people and goods. Got it. Um, and I gotta believe that now is gonna be a pretty exciting time for that sort of thing, given what's going on with driverless cars and electric cars and- yes. Uh, and, and rail systems, et cetera. Uh, you also mentioned that this is research policy connecting. So are you a policy institute as well or just purely research? We're a policy institute. So we, we address all four of those pillars I just mentioned. 
uh -huh. in equal ways, but of course, most of the funding goes to research. So we have a competitive request for proposals that we issue every year. We base that on high priority research needs that are submitted by key stakeholders. So elected officials, transit agency CEOs, Caltrans representatives, modal administrators, and more. I see. And, and, step, and stepping back, Roger, we actually lead three competitively selected multi-university consortia. So the first is funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation, and that's the Mineta Consortium for Transportation Mobility. It includes partners at Howard University, which is a historically black college and university in Washington, DC. Navajo Tech University, which is a rural small university in New Mexico, topped by 51% unemployment and surrounded by unpaved square miles of roads. So they really focus on workforce development. And then of course at San Jose State, we are Hispanic serving as well as Asian American Pacific Islander. So that particular consortium, Roger, was put together with an eye towards diversity, diversity in university size, in expertise taught, in student population, and in geography. So okay. we made sure we had a realistic, naturalistic test bed for our research. Got it. And then secondly, we lead, and this was funded through the California Road and Repair and Accountability Act of 2017, better known as the gas tax or Senate Bill 1, that um, identified a line item, and there's no sunset on this legislation, that puts $2 million annually to the California State University system to investigate surface transportation research and workforce development. The Chancellor's Office held a competition. We were victorious, so we lead all 23 campuses in that effort. Incidentally, those 23 campuses is the largest four-year public university system in the nation. Wow, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll come back and drill down a little bit on some of the things that you said. This is, again, is Roger Royce with <clears throat> Silicon Valley Impact on Tel Radio. I'm speaking with Karen Philbrook, PhD Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute, and we will be right back. Hello, and we're back. Roger Royce with Silicon Valley Impact on Tel Radio. We're talking with Ms. Karen Philbrick. She's an executive director of the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. And before the break, uh, we were just kind of going over what the Mineta Institute does and, and all of the different uh, programs and organizations that are involved in this uh, in improving mobility. And, you know, Karen, I got to tell you, being a resident of Silicon Valley, uh, one of the top three problems I'd say that we have in a valley is traffic and just getting from place to place. And we got a little bit of a reprieve, reprieve during COVID, but now things seem to be back to normal. And I'm wondering, is this a problem that maybe your organization would look at? And do you have any suggestions as to how to kind of reduce the stress on our highway system and get traffic to you know, people to move a little more easily, sort of like they do on the East Coast. <laughs> well, that's an amazing system they have on the East Coast between WMATA and Washington, D.C., and the subway system in New York City. Um, but back to your question about congestion. Certainly, pre-pandemic, we saw a bimodal distribution at the peak hours of commuting in the morning and commuting in the evening. Of course, we saw our roads empty at the height of the pandemic, and as we recover, what we're seeing in the Bay Area is congestion throughout the day and for different reasons than what we had it before. We have one of the lowest return to the office rates in the United States between San Jose and San Francisco, in large part because we're a white collar tech driven industry and people can work from home. So we're seeing that that traffic is happening all the time. But what we also know about public transportation is it's a lifeline for people who are who don't have a car. They're transit dependent. They don't have another way to get from point A to point B. And we often see this with our black and brown neighborhoods specifically and our frontline workers who maybe can't afford to live in the areas where they work. 
So they have super commutes as identified by 90 minutes or more to get to their paces of employment. So in public transportation, we try to reduce barriers and disincentives for use so that we get more people onto the system, thereby reducing greenhouse gas emissions, congestion, and providing, again, those ladders of economic opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I noticed during, since COVID, uh, I see that the city of San Francisco has extend, extended uh, its public transportation systems uh, so that now uh, you can get more places by train. Uh, it used to be Caltrain would drop you off down on 4th and Townsend, then you're kind of on your own to try to figure out where you're going. But now I notice that they have additional arteries there. So hopefully more of that will happen. And, and what you're talking about, Roger, is seamless integration. It's making sure that that first and last mile connection is addressed whether that's through a light rail, a bus, or active forms of transportation like scooters, bicycles, things of this nature. What we know about successful systems is that they connect to where people want to be, and they connect with less than a quarter or a half a mile of walking distance, because the research shows people are not likely to walk a half a mile to get to public transport. They'd rather just get in their cars and drive, so we need to make it easier on the user and they need to feel safe. You may have read in the recent past in the Bay Area, we've had an onslaught of transit assaults and we saw this across the nation. In fact, the SEPTA system in Philadelphia actually had a rape on one of the uh, train cars. And so we are trying to identify what the assault rate is and how to combat it. In fact, the Mineta Transportation Institute was codified into law through Senate Bill 1131, led by Senator Min here in California, to develop a survey instrument for use of transit agencies of various sizes to document assault and best practices for eliminating that. Wow, well, that's that's great to know. Um, I, I can see, yeah, of course, we've all been aware, we've all been hyper sensitive to to crime over the last few years. Uh, but you said something else that's really interesting. You know, California has a car culture. Mm -hmm. People don't want to walk anywhere. And that's part of the problem here. Part of it is just that cultural aspect. That just, for so many reasons, if we could just walk a quarter mile, uh, I think life would be a lot easier. But that's a and, whole And more healthy too, Roger. If you could just walk a half a mile, think about the impact on your health and well being. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You know, it's kind of interesting uh, what you said about the last mile problem. You know, we've had other guests on the show talk about the supply chain last mile problem oh, yes. or the blockchain last mile problem. But you mean it literally. <laughs> you mean actually getting somebody that last mile. Yes, I do. <laughs> you know, I was on, I, I flew through SFO, San Francisco Airport recently, and I don't know why I didn't know this before, but man, the train takes you right there. You know, um, don't need to drive there and fight traffic and pay parking fees. Uh, it's really, um, that's, you know, it's really something how the airports in Northern California have, have picked this up. That's right. Multimodal um, integration. Is that what they call that? Multimodal integration? Yes. Well, that, that, certainly, that certainly sounds like a worthy goal. I'm <laughs> to see that you're in charge and making that happen. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here. Again, this is Roger Royce with Silicon Valley Impact, I'm talking with Karen Philbrick, Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute, and we'll be right back after this short break. Hello, we are back. Roger Royce, Silicon Valley Impact, talking to Karen Philbrick, PhD. She's the Executive Director at the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University here in Silicon Valley. And we are talking about transportation research and policy and mobility. Karen, what would you say is maybe one of the major challenges or maybe major problems facing transportation in this country? Well, currently, like many other sectors, we are fighting to train that pipeline of the future. The transportation workforce is suffering. In fact, pre-pandemic, the U.S. Departments of Transportation, Education and Labor quantified that workforce shortage. And at that time, we needed to hire 417,000 people annually from the front line to the C-suite to keep our current systems operational, in large part because we have an aging workforce. 
Some call it the grain tsunami, but it means that right now half of the workforce is eligible for retirement, Roger, which means our systems would literally grind to a halt if they all took that opportunity to leave the workforce. So when we talk about that, we are talking about a vital service, a public good that public transportation provides. People who have and lack mobility is no different than having and lacking access to opportunity. We need to make sure we break down those barriers so people can live full, rich, and meaningful lives. But to do that, we need the qualified workforce. And at present, part of the problem is people can't name a position in transportation beyond airline pilot, bus driver, or maybe train operator. But as I mentioned at the beginning of our time together, I'm a psychologist who spent my whole career in transportation. And that story is not unique. Many people never realized they'd be in transportation, but they fell into it and they fell in love. We've got room for graphic designers, communication specialists, journalists, engineers, and more. And right now, only 15% of the current workforce is female. So we have an untapped market there. In fact, if you're looking at a business case, Roger, what we see from Fortune 500 companies is that only about 15% are led by female CEOs. But those organizations that have broad representation of females on their board or in their leadership ranks outperform the other organizations substantially on return on investment because we bring a plurality of voices, a different communication strategy, a different way to address problems and needs. Right. And so what's incumbent upon us as transportation professionals is social modeling, allowing younger people to see what's possible, allowing young girls to see how, themselves in these positions. So we need to start in the K through 12 sector, getting kids excited and interested in this field. If we start when they're in college, we're too late. And not to mention, not everybody is destined to get a four-year college degree. So we need the mechanics. We need all sorts of people in this industry. You know, it's interesting uh, as you're speaking, I gotta believe that technology and automation is playing a more and more prominent role in transportation. So that's opening up new jobs. And yes. new areas, and and I know that that young people today are very concerned about obsolescence because they see people's jobs becoming obsolete fairly immediately. But this sounds like an area where there's lots of room for growth uh, in new tech. Would you say that's true? I would say that's true, absolutely. Yeah, and and what about that automation? Are we seeing because I've seen we've seen that in other industries, especially in California, where because of a declining workforce. Uh, we're seeing automation take over. You see more automation in, in what transportation? Yes and no. We see the research and the development, but we don't really see it in practice. So when uh, you talk about autonomous vehicles, for example, we certainly have the level one and level two with our dynamic braking and our, our kind of signals when you go over a lane or even the car's ability to, to shift you back if you seem to be driving over the lines. But full automation without a driver, there's only one place in the United States that that's currently happening, and that's Chandler, Arizona, where you can actually dial up a driverless taxi to take you from point A to point B. But when you talk about the landscape of individuals from young to old in the United States, you've got a user acceptance problem. My mom, for example, isn't going to feel comfortable with a driverless car, she'll feel like the lack of control. How do you take over? What about cybersecurity risk? Where some of our younger Gen Zers might think that it's the coolest thing going because they can watch a movie or engage in extracurricular activities while the car is moving them. So we we see the technology, but we don't yet see it fully implemented. Yeah. Hey, I got. I have to ask you uh, since we're on technologies. What about flying cars? Uh, oh, because yeah. I've seen several companies developing flying cars. I know some VCs that are very interested in the area. That sounds to me like a logistical nightmare. Is that something that you think can, can be made to happen? Absolutely. In fact, there's over 400 companies in the United States alone researching and developing a flying taxi. 
I mean, it, I liken it to the Jetsons. That's yeah. a long ago cartoon, but they had robots that talked. They had watches that monitored. Why wouldn't we have flying cars? We've achieved everything else in that vision of the Jetsons. And there are there's discussion about making it affordable in some cases. It's not just for the elite. And it's called urban air mobility. Mm-hmm. And it's designed to go up. So it's a vertiport where instead of going down a runway like our traditional flights, it goes up and it goes from point A to point B. And it's absolutely on the horizon and absolutely will come to fruition. That's really interesting. That, that'll that be something to see. And then finally, uh, I've been hearing a lot about drones and easing the pain on the supply chain. Um, and I know they're out there. Uh, but um, again, to me, that just sounds like a very cluttered, polluted, you know, airspace. Uh, what do you think? I mean, are we going to have drones delivering packages? Is that something that we think we could even do as a policy matter? Is there a research project on that? Yes, yes, and yes. And <sighs> so, but aside from product delivery, because we talked earlier about that first and last mile connection whether it's for people getting to transit or packages getting to people. This is one of the solutions to congestion is getting trucks off the road and having drones do delivery. And yes, it'll lead to a congested airspace, but that's something for the FAA. That's I do surface transportation. Mm-hmm. But I will say this, one of the two greatest impacts of drones to date that we see that's already operational are drones are used to inspect bridges to determine their fatigue and how much longer they have in the lifespan. This is so important because bridge inspectors are few and far between, and it takes some serious workforce hours to rappel down the side of a bridge and investigate it. So drones are sending real-time information to the engineers and allowing them to make decisions on what they're gonna fortify or even rebuild. And that's critically important because according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, we've got about a a D plus in our transportation here in California. So we need to address everything from potholes to bridge fatigue. Secondly, because I mentioned a second highlight, we've got a problem nationwide on grade crossing accidents and trespasser incidents. So what I mean by that is people have little patience. If they're stopped for a train and they see it far away, they might try to beat that gate to get to where they're going, but they don't realize that trains are relatively silent and they they operate fast. So for example, a loaded freight train takes over a mile to stop once it's thrown into emergency. It's got the weight ratio of a freight train hitting an SUV as an SUV hitting a can, a tin can. And then you've got a segment of people who have lack situational awareness. Maybe they're walking along the tracks and they've got earbuds in or they're otherwise distracted and they don't hear or see the train coming by. Or worse, maybe they're trying to commit suicide. We're seeing drones actually fulfill a need here because they can monitor the track because tracks are long, miles and miles and miles, especially when you're talking about freight. And they can send messages back to the yard office and train master, or even be a voice of God saying, get off the tracks, train coming, or they can send security personnel out there to physically remove the person. So drones are operational, they are necessary, and they're one of the tools in the technology toolkit for transportation. Wow, it's amazing. Well, before I let you go, I have to ask you about um, that uh, sign behind you, number one most transformative university, Money Magazine. Uh, What does that mean? I'm so glad you asked because I'm very proud of being a Spartan at San Jose State University. Basically, Money Magazine looked across the landscape of public universities to see what the most transformative ones And we won that designation based on three very specific facts. Loan graduation rates, loan repayment, and job retention. We cater to a first-generation student population, so kids who maybe don't have a role model in their nuclear family of what college education looks like. And we're really making a difference in people's lives in a meaningful way. Okay. Well, very interesting. 
I want to thank you, Karen, for being here with us today. Uh, this is Roger Roy, Silicon Valley Impact on Tal Radio. We've been talking with Karen Philbrick. She's the Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. Thank you very much, Karen, and we will see you all next time.